This is Remote Ruby. Have you any remote idea to the meaning of the word? What's up? Set. What's up? Andrew, welcome back. Thank you. I have returned the prodigal son. I played with JavaScripts and now I'm back to mama. <laughs> was it as good as the promise? <laughs> no, it, dude, it was actually like the worst. But I don't want to talk about it because, dude, Rails is very good. I wrote some Rails for the first time in a while. It felt like, oh, man, it just feels so good. I went back to an app I built in March that I haven't touched since March, but like people still use. And it just felt so good because it's a small app and it's a Rails app. And I didn't add anything like the most complex, like dependency I added was Tailwind. So it was like just Rails. There was no view component. There was no stimulus reflex, like all things I love, but it was just so basic. Like last night I sat down, put it on my laptop and got it updated in 20 minutes. It was great. I think I finally learned. I love tools, dude. I love them so much, but I think I finally hit my stoic state where I'm like, yeah, I could add that. I could have commit linting and SAS linting and YAML linting and prettier and standard. And I, I still use standard. That's, that's one well, of my I, I have just, I don't add it to the gem file because it runs in VS code. So I don't oh, need yeah. to add it. So I literally just, just go. No actions, no CI, just, just cooling it. Oh yeah. <laughs> this project also has no test. Maybe that's why it's nice. so great. <laughs> Open up the <laughs> test directory. I was like, oh, Good job. This was a good, no wonder this was such a good March for you. <laughs> yeah, everything just works. It's nice. Run Rails test, zero of zero passed. Boom. Very fast. Very <laughs> fast. Yeah, I know it was cool. I sat down to upgrade it to, after I got like Ruby and Rails upgraded, I started up doing the tail end 2.0 update. And I was pleasantly surprised how easy it was for most things. Big pause on the most part. Yes. (laughs) Because it worked and it was quick and I got to remove the Tailwind UI dependency in favor of like Tailwind form, stuff like that. The thing I did not expect, which is not like a fault on them, it's 2.0, it's a breaking change. But all the forms then that were copied out of Tailwind UI examples in March now no longer look the same. So that sent me into a little bit of a, do you want to see this thing through or do you want to like get reset hard? And I saw it through. I had that moment where I was upgrading jumpstart pro and it was like, Oh, checkboxes are invisible now. And (laughs) you know, all the forms need kind of rewriting, but I will say that, because I was using add apply to make like button classes and mm. just kind of make it a little bit more familiar if you use bootstrap mostly. And oh my gosh, the add apply working with pseudo selectors just deleted a bunch of CSS because it works with pseudo selectors now. It does. That I, you can just mean, straight that's copy like the, the example. Thing. It's so good. You just like straight copy the example, dump it in your add apply, and you're done. It was the best. Feature that I don't know that anyone really talked about because like Adam said, you said don't use it, but we do because it makes it easier if you, you know, come from bootstrap. But boy, that is a time saver. I love that. Well, you want to know something else? It's actually been in Tailwind since 1.8 or 9. You just had to turn it on. Aha, okay. They didn't really surface that config very well. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, because we had fun. What was that? It came out last Wednesday or something? Yeah. That marketing video was good. It was, yeah. I patched Webpacker that night to fix the Webpack dev server changes. And yeah, that was not my favorite upgrade, but I got to that point, Jason, where I was like, this is going to be harder than I thought. And it was because I got to the point of, okay, we're using the node module gem from master. And now that doesn't totally work completely. So I got to go fork the gem and then use that temporarily. And then I was like, I'm really diving deep into this rabbit hole all of a sudden. And (laughs) 
follow through I went through, to update Webpacker it works. and I saw the latest merge into Webpacker Exit 3 and I was like <laughs> Chris has been here Chris is yeah. doing the work yeah I too was like oh I've been in Webpack for a while I can fix this real quick and I went to go make the change and I was like oh Chris did it perfect <laughs> I didn't yeah. even have to update the gem. I just had to update the node package. I tested that. Mm. Yeah, because we just went all in, you know, node module straight from master, but might as well do the gem from master too. And yeah, post CSS changed and a webpack and all the dependencies and stuff. And that was just one of the leftover things because the webpack dev server is not its own command. It lives inside of webpack now. But you still need the package installed for that command to exist or whatever. Because I thought maybe... No, you don't have to. There's alternatives now that are actually like oh, faster. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, because I was curious why it changed and I couldn't find any examples. Because the error that you got, I looked up on Webpack's issues and it was like, yeah, just don't run that anymore. Run Webpack serve. And I was, okay, but why? Didn't link to the change or why it happened. So I made it just out of the blue, but I wondered what was going on because it seemed like there was some reason for it. And when I removed the Webpack dev server, I was maybe it just runs and it's built into Webpack now, but that was still a required dependency. And it was kind of interesting to try and figure that out and reverse engineer. Like, what did they do? Well, and why did they do it? Well, it was for you because you were not running Webpack 5. You were running Webpack 4, which does require it. And Webpack, and this is the reason all of this has happened, is because Webpack has moved to Module Federation and Webpack 5, and a lot of those things are going away. And the same with PostCSS. They had to do a major version bump, which I had heard they thought they were going to be releasing Tailwind 2 without it. And then it just happened. They uh, remember, It all came together. I remember Adam talking about that like just before the Tailwind 2 release. Yeah. Not very long. And I was kind of surprised they had that. But they also have the post-CSS 7 compatible version. Right. Uh, which I never even looked at. I was like, let's go. You know, all in. Let's do it. Yeah. So if I pointed my Webpacker to master right now, I could do the like the straight up post-CSS 8 version of Tailwind. Yeah, the Webpacker yeah. node module now depends on 8.0 and master for post CSS. Okay. Which so, didn't work if you didn't make that change because of the post CSS loader issue. I didn't even try Webpack. it because I, oh, I saw I people I saw people talking about it because Adam tweeted that like Rails was one of the first people to merge post CSS eight. Webpacker was one of the first ones that supported it. Nice. But I but knew we, that I wasn't they didn't cut it. I knew that, yeah, I wasn't running whatever they did. So I just said, you know what? I'm going to play it safe because I was already having such a good night, right? Right. So. Well, and the problem is right now, which I mean, it's not going to be a problem much longer, but Rails new right now gives you Webpack or 4.1, I believe. And they're already on 5.2. And I remember specifically there being a bug with Tailwind where people would be like, hey, man, my Tailwind won't run. And I'll be like, hey, are you on Webpack or 4? If you are, then that's the problem. And that consistently fixed the issue. That's interesting. Fun fact, I don't know why, but Rails uh, Webpacker's master version, the like 5.2 is out, 5.2.1, I believe. And then in master, it's version 5.1.1. So I don't know where it degraded or like <laughs> went backwards, but it's kind of funny. <laughs> I can't wait to update to 5.1.1.2 and get yeah. featured. Ahead of, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's the Benjamin Button <laughs> version <laughs> management. <laughs> <laughs> that was really good. I ran into just one issue, so I, I went ahead. It's a small enough app that I fixed all my forms to match like the new inputs, and everything was smooth until I did my. I even released this thing in pieces. Like I did, this was good. I was firing on all cylinders and the last release was like tailwind to upgrade and <laughs> I didn't have purge CSS on. I'm not even going to compile this. You're an idiot. And I was like, that's fair. So I went in and turned purge on, got it down to 16 kilobytes, like something stupid. But then 
half of my text inputs, like half of my like inputs worked and the other half didn't. And the reason is because the new Tailwind Forms library doesn't rely on class names. It actually is like input type equals text. Me as a Rails developer only uses form helpers to build text fields. So nowhere in my code is there an input type equals text. So that gets clobbered. So then I'm like, okay, I'll just add input to the whitelist or whatever they call it, the, the allow list. That didn't work. Spent an hour on this. Ended up, let me pull it up. I ended up having to, in my Tailwind config. You, uh, wait, you went through an hour and still we're trying to do it through the Tailwind config? Why didn't you just use your the post CSS config? Because I just wanted to. Because upgrades? Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I respect it. I've been there. Yeah, this lot. is interesting because I didn't run into that issue and I'm using purge CSS through the Tailwind config. And do you, you have like an a, input? Type equals text outside of your form, your Rails builder anywhere. I don't think so. I can check, but I'm pretty sure I don't because I do the same thing every single time, you know, a helper. So it's here's not what in those happened. docs, like in the docs for Jumpstart. Maybe. I don't know. I like, I put just a, a regular old HTML input in there. I turned enabled on to true so I could have it run in development. Sure enough, it started working after that. Try in the safe list. I tried giving it input type equals text. I went through all these things. In the content list, I added a, uh, Ruby, a JavaScript object where I give it this raw string of HTML. It's literally a string that says HTML body input type equals text in body in HTML. Started working. That's funny. You would think that plugin, and maybe it's a, a bug in the plugin, but it you would expect it to integrate with the purge CSS stuff to like auto whitelist those or something. Well, hmm. I thought this story was going to end with you just leaving an input in the code and I was fully prepared to stand behind <laughs> you on that. <laughs> just put it in an HTML comment and you're good to go. Yeah. Class <laughs> equals hidden. <laughs> I just dropped a screenshot of my, what I had to do. I mean, it's only three lines. It's fine, but it was so wild. It was like, is everything I'm doing wrong? Should I be using Bootstrap? Do I know how computers work? <laughs> yeah, I, it may be that the Jumpstart docs have some inputs. I do see input type equals text in the forms docs that we have. And I know that we have most of the you know inputs in there. So maybe if I remove that, I'll run it and see that just disappears. That'd be funny. Huh. It was crazy. I felt like I was taking crazy pills. But the other thing is like the email field worked just fine. The text area worked just fine. It was only this input type equals text. So that's anyway. pretty funny. Yeah. Originally, this was before Tailwind had the purge CSS stuff built in. I had went and manually set up purge CSS, but boy, that was like a constant support problem because you know, every time people deploy something to production, and even when I was doing it nonstop, oh yeah, this button color is just gone and these random things are just disappeared. And it would catch me every single time, especially when you pull in tippy JS for tooltips or something. And you're like, my tooltips don't look right. They look fine in development, but moving it into the Tailwind config is way better because then it's like any... Third party stuff you pull in is good automatically. And then just Tailwind itself gets stripped, which is great. Before we go anywhere, wait, Jason, are you using four spaces in this JavaScript file? No, I'm using two. Okay. But you're seeing like a very. Right. Okay. I'm just making sure. I'm inside a modules.export and you're just way down in the file. But you don't have it set. So, oh, well, no, never mind. I take that back because you're escaping. Okay. All right. We're good. I thought we were about to paint that bike shed, dude. I cannot stand the four spaces. There, well, technically it's eight spaces, but that's just because it's well, so nested inside of something. Right. Like when I hit tab, I want two spaces to come out, not four. Bruh, if you hit tab on anything on my computer, it's going to give you two spaces. Even if you're like 
in Apple Music. It's like, here's two spaces. So, Dude, I respect it. That's how they know. They know who's been here. Well, that also may be because I'm pretty sure Apple Music's just one big web interface inside a shell, but that's another story for another day. But yeah, the Tail and 2.0 thing, all things considered, is pretty painless upgrade. It's very cool to come back to a project nine months later and still be thrilled with how it looks. I don't know that I've ever had that feeling, so that was cool. I envy that feeling. I deeply do. Last week, we talked about the, uh, the Ryan Bates Digital Ocean extravaganza. Andrew, you weren't here. Yeah, I totally was like, no, we didn't. What are you talking about? But it had one hell of a resolve. Oh, my God, uh, did it, yeah. dude. It I was with, thrilled. Last night, me sitting on my chair opening Twitter and seeing Ryan Bates, who, like we talked about last week, hasn't tweeted much since 2017, say... DigitalOcean's giving me five grand to give to open source project of my choice, giving it to Hopsoft, giving it to Nate and Stimulus Reflex. That was so like classy. all of my worlds colliding. Yeah. <laughs> Past, yeah, so present, good. future. I felt true joy in that moment. And it's been a long 2020 since I've felt that, like just pure joy. And also because I'm weird and I have notifications set on for Ryan Bates because I was like, one day he's going to he's gonna return and I'm going to know about it. And he did. So I just kept, <laughs> I, I have no, anytime he tweets, I get a notification and I got that notification today. It was a good day. I don't remember what I was doing, but I remember I opened Twitter and I was like, whoa. And yeah, couldn't have gone to a better person. So I'm really excited yeah. for that. That is good stuff. And to a, not to a better project either. Yeah, agreed. So what my real question and takeaway out of all of this, though, is that number one, Ryan Bates knows what stimulus reflex is. So just a theory here. Does Ryan Bates listen to this podcast? No. He could also just be seeing everyone talking about stimulus reflex. Yeah, but he could. He could. I'm- He's still a developer. Joe it's Biden not like he just hate- podcast. Well, I would like to know about that because that would make me feel very proud. Well, I'm just saying <laughs> it is possible that anyone listens to this, but well, Ryan, if you're out there, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. I emailed yes. Ryan when we first started this, trying to get him to come on the show. So, if in fact you are listening, Ryan, that offer stands <laughs> until this show burns into the ground. So, uh, yeah, that would be so much fun. We'll start a Kickstarter. How much does it cost? Everyone's got a price. <laughs> yeah, well, we need at least five grand. Digital Ocean thought his trouble was worth. So, well, if you think about it, there's a whole like generation of Rails developers now that have never known him to be more than the voice on YouTube. Like, he's not like around. We all know he's gone. And so, I don't know. It's kind of cool. Holy crap. He is out there watching over us. Watching over similar yeah, reflex. Like, he's the why the lucky stiff that actually still pops up here and there. <laughs> why is still so fascinating to me. So I just want to know which one of us is going to drop out next and just disappear from the community and just pop up maybe once every 10 years. I mean, if we're going to be honest, it's going to be you. If Jason and I are being real with ourselves, but I would like to think it would be me. I tried well, to leave. But yeah, I think you and I are kind of stuck here. But Chris, you seem like you're in like the prime opportunity to leave because a ton of people, not that people wouldn't know if Jason and I are just left, but in the community, if you just left, uh oh. So you have to become valuable to the community and then just disappear. Is that well, yeah, the because if you're not answering their emails, dude, there could be riots. Mm, that's true. So we want to encourage riots. Well, that's what you're saying. I mean, yeah. way to, if it's way about to email. Ruin something so wholesome, Andrew. Wait, man. <laughs> hey, man. If it, we're writing about email, then I think it's all right. Yeah, I hope that none of us leave. I have a few people like I keep up with friends and stuff. It didn't make a difference that I came back to Twitter to like anyone. So like, Chris, if Chris it made left, a difference though, to me. Well, I was like, sweet. Now I can tag you on stuff and not send them over Slack. Yeah, but let's <laughs> let's evaluate 
it's going to be like some kind of Hamill meme, some kind of old person meme. <laughs> you're welcome. God, dude, you're <laughs> listing off like a buffet of amazing like things. I mean, I'm still waiting for that <laughs> Hamill ERB thing you promised to drop some kind of video you were making. I totally had the full intention to make that video, but our editor made the most amazing like <laughs> trailer for that. And it, it blew me away. It was like top notch. It was like actual pro level. And I was like, I can't even compete. So I'm not going to. In a world in the grips of a worldwide pandemic, one man is sent to infect the minds of others. Andrew M. Codes Pictures presents Exposed. Hamill, dude. Please stand by for a coming message for Agent Andrew M. Codes. Would you be willing to take a mission for us? <laughs> oh, yeah, I would. You are needed to infiltrate Remote Ruby's podcast for us. Right. Your mission is to get Jason Chance and Chris Oliver to say they love Hamill by any means necessary. That sounds painful. Jason Charnes. Oh, God. Like, what did we do wrong? <laughs> Andrew Mason. I'm going to take this conversation and it's going in the movie. And Chris Oliver. I would much prefer ERB, I think. Wired Magazine called it a gem for 2020. DHH says, quit blowing up my Hay account with your stupid movie. And the Wilmington Star News says Andrew Mason's performance is Oscar worthy. Say it. Say it, Chris Oliver. We love Hamill. Say it again. We love Hamill. I'm having so much fun. Why? Hamill. Exposed. Exposed. Are you really including us in this video? Oh, absolutely. This film's not yet rated and suitable for devs only. Well, with this project I've been working on, I've been using the Hatchbox, which I know we kind of talked about before the show. But it was so nice that it just works still. That's good. That's good. <laughs> yeah, like I had a problem because I moved my repo to a brand new organization. I did this in like April. And so I had to like go and tell GitHub, no, forget about Hatchbox. Oh, yeah. I need Literally. to update that error message because you can just go back into GitHub and go into your authorized OAuth apps. Oh, and just, and just give it more access. permissions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's just I, whatever permissions it got originally, which is like defaults to all of the orgs you own, I think, not ones that you're a member of. So yeah, that trips up me sometimes. And the first time that somebody was like, yeah, I can't clone my repo. I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like every repo I've ever cloned works fine. And then it took us a while and we realized the SSH keys that we upload through that OAuth is actually tied to the OAuth connection. So they only have permissions that you give it, which is kind of cool. Like it's nice that totally. it's fine grained. Totally. Yeah. I was actually just so proud that I didn't have to open a support ticket. I was <laughs> like, yes, figured it out. Yeah. So. I have a log analyzer thing. And it just like prints out some kind of general advice on whenever something goes wrong that it detects. And that's one that I need to go and say, if this message happens and you know, you're using GitHub for this app, I should just link you to that. And it would save a lot of trouble. So I'll make a note to go fix that. <laughs> yeah, well, I knew, it, I knew it was my fault because I knew that I had added, I created that organization way after I attached Hatchbox. So I knew it was on me. And when I disconnected and reconnected, I was like, oh, like, it's probably still using the same type of connection. So that's why I was like, just forget that Hatchbox exists. And then it was like, here you go. Here's everything that you need. So it was yeah, perfect. That works just fine. That reminds me of, they've fixed it in DigitalOcean, but, you know, I'm using DigitalOcean regularly to test stuff. And their OAuth was, so in general, when you click on OAuth, you can like, re-authenticate the same account a bunch of times, right? And for whatever reason, DigitalOcean used to not allow you to reconnect the same account, like the same cool. team. And I was like, well, this is not good because what if I want to use the same team on two different Hatchbox accounts or something? And yeah, it was, yeah, you can't do that. But they fixed that recently. But those OAuth is 
one of the biggest pain in the butts ever. You know, it's just not, it's, uh, it's clunky feeling. It's not smooth and it's just confusing to users because you have permissions stored somewhere else and it's hard to go find what's going on. And it's up to the developer to like do all this error handling and say, eh, you better go back to, you know, GitHub and go fix it yourself. You can't fix it for you, which sucks. One of our major integrations at Podius still struggles from that problem. Like they have a public forum. And tons of developers, when I say tons, I mean, I mean, probably 20. No, it's not a small amount. Have been like, look, I keep getting this OAuth error. And they're like, yeah, we know. Like, we're going to work on it. But that was like March. And so we still, like, when it comes in to like our roll bar stack at work, we have to be like, hey, go tell them to disconnect and reconnect. I know it's a, a pain, but like, our hands are kind of tied here. But That's yeah, Hatchbox, I don't know. I just wanted to, once again, publicly shout it out because I enjoy using it. I know you're doing some stuff behind the scenes on it. There's one other thing that I was happy about with it. So I set up subdomains on Hatchbox for this project. I guess I've never set up subdomains where I pay for it on Heroku. And I didn't realize how expensive it was on Heroku. And I just got so used to how free it was how not extra it was to do it on Hatchbox. What costs on Heroku? So you add your domain and you offer your you subdomains. Do, so you want to do wild cards? Uh-huh. Then you have to pay 80 bucks a month or something like that. Ooh, that's a lot. I'm be like, cut this out. I'm going to raise some prices first. Yeah. <laughs> to- totally. <laughs> it's so funny. You know, the SSL with Let's Encrypt is free wild cards. So I'm like, Whatever. You don't have to pay for any of that. There's no reason to. So that's crazy. Because, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Their load balancer may be extra taxed for those customers or something because it could be any subdomain or whatever. I don't know. It doesn't seem like there's a whole lot that would, other than they know you're getting more value out of Heroku. They just charge you for it, I guess. They're assuming that you're going to you know, make more money than an app that only has one domain. Yeah, let's see here. I'm pretty sure like their regular like SSL add-on is 20 bucks and that's it. But I don't think that there's something that required me to use subdomains. Expedited SSL. So SSL certificates as a service, but to use their wild card is 74 bucks a month. And I was like, mm. dang, there is one major bug I need to fix that does frustrate me and a lot of people. So Hatchbox, like Heroku, will spin up a subdomain for your apps so you can easily access two apps on the same IP address. But I do not currently have Let's Encrypt running for those. And that would be a real nice improvement to make so that we could have those set up automatically. So one of the things we're exploring is using Caddy instead of Nginx as the web server for version 2. But in the interim, I actually might just go back and you know, when you set up an app on Hatchbox, just auto grab you an SSL cert using the, which you call it, acme.sh for uh, Let's Encrypt. But I think it's going to require me to set up two server blocks for your app, like one with your own domains and one with the Hatchbox domain, because they will probably have different SSL certs and kind of a thing. So I've just been like, eh, but when it comes in, As a support request, which it inevitably does, I know to check that pretty quickly. And it's been a little minor support headache, but the dev time to go fix that is like significantly more. So it's Mm -hmm. interesting to evaluate that and decide when is it important enough that it'll be saving enough time to invest the extra amount to go fix it. So it's probably about that point where I need to just go fix it. Speaking of Hatchbox, a weird segue. But your app, we talked about this the other day, but your app is the only one that I have desktop notifications turned on for because I think web desktop notifications are like a <laughs> terrible thing. Yep. But I want to know so I can go do other things and know when my server is deployed. And Cable Ready, the latest update, actually has an API for sending those types of notifications. And I think that is so cool. Like it makes me want to go use them. Yeah. When you sent me that, I was like, oh, no way. Like I can go replace all that code 
that is basically the same thing they have implemented. And I can just replace that with now my app only has to care about the server side stuff, which is great because the client side ended up getting to be kind of a big if statement or like a case statement where it's effectively doing the same stuff as cable ready, where I'm like, look, if this is the type of message that came across is a notification, run the notification. If it's this, do that and so on. And it's like, boy, now cable ready takes care of almost all of those things for me. Like streaming logs now, just use the insert adjacent mm-hmm. HTML or a pen text or whatever, and notifications are done. And so I've been doing cable ready in the new version, but I really think I'm going to go back to the old one and strip out my JavaScript, clean it all up, swap it over to cable ready, and just simplify things quite a bit. And I think it's going to be awesome. So yeah, that and the morph, which I don't have in Hatchbox right now, if you're a server, so one of the, the like bugs that's been in there forever, you create a new cluster, your server is being created on DigitalOcean. It doesn't have an IP address right away or whatever. And in Hatchbox, it displays that and it's like provisioning or whatever. And it says waiting for IP And you have to actually refresh the page because it never... I don't have any JavaScript to send the IP address over and replace that. And I can just use Cable Ready to re-render that whole div instead. And that will save me a lot of time. So I was like, man, it's about time to just go swap it all out with Cable Ready. Because I was basically creating Cable Ready on my own when I started Hatchbox. But I didn't know that... I should be extracting this out as a reusable thing. I was going and building all these individual things in this same approach. So it's really cool to be like, oh, I guess it was on the right track. Like, yeah, cable ready. Like, I I don't remember if we talked about this publicly. I never talked about privately. Like, I still adore Stimulus Reflex, but I'm like super in on cable ready right now. And I love in the new version now you can chain cable ready methods together. So, you know, before you'd be like cable ready, your channel dot insert adjacent HTML. And then you have to do the same thing again. And so now you can just be like, call that cable ready with the channel once and just keep chaining methods on like insert adjacent HTML, remove element, add data. That is slick. It's just those little quality of life things that are. Yeah. Yeah. I remember we talked a little bit at one point and we're like, the interface just feels a little clunky. And that one really solves a lot of that where it's like not the redundant setup with cable ready every time you just chain those and queue them all up and you're good to go. Because most of the time you're publishing three actions on the same channel or something. And that makes a lot of sense. So it's pretty cool. I'm excited to upgrade to that version and start using that. Because there's, I think most of the times I use it, I do more than one thing. Yeah. See, I can't remember what we talked about on the show last week and what we talked about after, but I built a Cards Against Humanity online version uh, to play with my friends because I had COVID and couldn't do anything. And I used cable ready for it. And that was one of the things like I was doing a lot of cable ready actions to the same channel. And so that would have been nice to have. Another cool thing that they added was the ability to do push state, like the native browser add to the history. And we had done something like that. When I say we, one of my coworkers, Kyle, had done something like that at Podio where we call it a turbo flex. And what it is, it will do that push state and it will modify the window location to add like a query param and we use it for filtering. So we tell reflex, Hey, we've added this param we've added to the history. And then we just read it back out of the controller using like stimulus reflex. So we still get that no page reload to update the table. We're still running our animations through reflex. But if you were like to click back and reload the page, or if you were to just click reload where you're at, you would stay where you were. And I think cable ready having that functionality is going to allow us to pull all that custom stuff we've written out and just rely on that now. That's awesome. Yeah, the, the push state stuff was like, <laughs> the you remember the days of your JavaScript framework not changing the URL whatsoever and just, oh, great, now I can't share a link to anything with anyone. If you ever do 
uh, JavaScript that changes the page like that, like even just adding a query parameter, do it with push state because now every page in view is shareable. That's the whole point of having a URL. <laughs> right. Yeah. We've been talking about that for some stuff at Podia. There's some things we want to deep link while using like cable Ooh. ready. Yeah. And so it was like, okay, well, that is one less thing we're going to have to figure out down the road. Yeah, that's nice. Those are really welcome changes to, to Cable Ready. So yeah, I'm super excited to upgrade to that version. They just keep pumping out new features, don't they? That's constant. Yeah, and I'm going to conveniently come back and start contributing again. <laughs> I've been... Nah, not even... But it's just, oh, now people are going to be like popping out and see what's, see what's up over here. This is going to get shared around. And I am the one who originally made a lot of the demos. So it's probably a good time to go check on that, check on some of the tutorials I've written and make sure they're up to date. So Because like in the beginning, I was the one writing the tutorials. Nate and I were building the demos. Yeah, and I think Stimulus Reflex and Cable Ready and stuff are some good examples of good docs. So thanks for doing that. I think that was not me. Let well, that was Lee's bad completely. Well, yeah, he's the docs were all him. I want to be very clear. He did a great <laughs> job. He's done an amazing job on that, but the demos are like equally important too. So the demos are nice. Yeah. 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 I, I just I, got I need demos. So I don't want to watch you build an app. I'd rather just see the demo. So that's why yeah. I, I wanted to get those out there as well. Yeah, I just did uh I did a screencast on using Access Tenant and threw it in the README, you know, just for anybody that's like even those simple questions of what do I use for multi tenancy, a row level multi tenancy or the apartment schema style and those little questions and stuff. Get all those things that people commonly ask in that README in a screencast in the doc somewhere and it will save a tremendous amount of time for people. So I think Stimulus Reflex and Cable Ready have always done a very good job of lots of demos, lots of docs, just good stuff. Props to you guys for working on that. That's funny you say that because I say I don't document, but I'm literally was just thinking, like I've been writing down, I call it my kitchen sink. I've been throwing like random scripts from like the apps that I don't actually do anything with for Bridgetown and like configs and stuff like that are shareable like into a repo. And I was like, I feel like the main problem with some of this documentation, not that there's a problem, but the thing that would be more helpful is if this was like, instead of here are all the docs, it's like, this is, let's walk you through a story. Let's build an app together. And I'm constantly building just like little demos. So yeah, I need to see the sauce. I still want to build a Bridgetown site with you. Even though like I've already built one and kind of got my feet wet, I think it would be fun to hang out and do that. Dude, I have I, one. I've got mine doing stuff that would knock your socks off. I've got storybook running. I've got like a hot module reloading. Dude, I've got ES22. Ooh. Okay, so hear me out. I want to revise my statement. I still think it'd be fun to build a bridge down the site with you on a normal path, not yeah. down one of these Andrew Mason paths. Well, to that point, that is something I realized that was happening. And I was internally struggling with it a lot because I was like, on one hand, I want to write cool shit. And on the other hand, if someone comes behind me and looks at this, they're going to be like, what the crap is going on? And I feel like one of the, like, the most appealing parts about Rails is that there's so little config. Mm. And I was like, if I start adding a crap ton of config, I'm like really doing the project a disservice. So instead of doing a crap ton of config, I have my crap ton of config, but I've spread it across to like different. I'll just introduce like one piece here and one piece there instead of just an entirely different looking repo where like your folders are different names and yada. Like n- no more of that. We need heroes like you doing that kind of work. Because I don't want to do that kind of work. So, yeah, I, it shows you the nasty part of things. But to, I guess, its point, like when I saw that post CSS error, I knew exactly what the problem was. And I opened up Webpacker and I was like, okay, I, I know exactly how to fix this problem. I can now read Webpacker. So, that was a nice thing to figure out. You should add Webpacker as a language on Duolingo. Oh, so I can learn it in my spare time. It's so awful that I'm more reaffirmed behind my position of snowpack. Just, it's just so bad. 
I also want to figure out why when we started this call, there was like light in your room. And now it looks like you're about to breathe fire. It is so dark and you are like completely red. Well, I have a bunch of red on my screen. It was really <laughs> light in here and I was like, this is way too light. So I need to get the dark, get the darkness. It scared me a little. Yeah, it's, it's he gets really into red. this mood whenever you talk about JavaScript. Well, I can turn like, the light back it. on. It's just my eyes <laughs> felt a little strained and I was like, all right, it's time to do something. No, you take care of your eyes. Just don't put any kind of evil spell on us. I think that would have happened a long time ago, if yeah, possible. Your, I go to bed sometimes and I just see Hamel means and I just wake up and scream. Dude, that makes me so happy. Do, I know I sent it to Chris. Did I send, did you see it? An unnamed, I'm not, I don't want to call them out, but someone messaged me the other day and they're like, yeah, I think I'm a Hamel guy now. And I was like, oh man, that's one. Who's next? Yeah. <laughs> I saw, are falling. I was like so happy at work. I'm writing a bunch of ERB because our code base is historically Hamel and we're moving to ERB. And I just get so proud every time I get to right click, delete some kind of Hamel file. Well, I mean, I guess I'm quietly, I <clears throat> at this point, I'd rather write ERB, but you know, only because it's just like a, a massive context shift that I'm like, uh, now I have to re remember this. Just mm. like whenever I move, every time mm. I change jobs, they change testing frameworks. And then every single time, I'm like, Ugh, why can't we just use our spec? <laughs> I was actually one of the bright sides last night of opening that and saying I had written no tests meant that I hadn't removed many tests. So that means that when I sit down to write tests tonight, I'll be in my happy place. No, I want to picture you sitting down writing tests tonight. Okay. On the day before a break. Because yeah. if you do that, you, no, nah, that's too Tomorrow, much. Tomorrow, when my wife asks me what I'm thankful for, I'm going to look her dead in the eyes and tell her mini test. And somewhere, I'm just going to like grab my chest and be like, oh, a disturbance. I use RSpec every day. It's fine. Uh, it's, I know RSpec way better than I know mini tests, but I really enjoy writing mini tests. Well, here's a trick. I only wrote RSpec for three months, and I feel like I know RSpec so much better than many tests. So, and I've been writing many tests for three years. Well, yep. I think this difference in opinion in us is what keeps this love burning. It's a mutual respect. <laughs> Not speaking of, I'm, I have noticed that I do that. I say speaking of, and then I say something completely opposite but to just kind of push us forward here a little bit. There's been a lot of controversy around the new Mac. The new Mac, what's the chip called? The M1? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, because I don't know. Apparently it's super awesome, but then Apple is also prohibiting you from getting a Mac of with more than 16 gigabytes of RAM. That's kind of sucks. But there's been a lot of chatter about the new chip and like how things were going to work. And... Also, how Big Sur was going to work. And I wasn't going to upgrade, which I almost always do. And I heard things and I was scared. So I got a brand new computer because I just started a new job. And it was already pre-updated to... like it's, it's a new one. It's just not an M1. It's the other chip, not the old chip, the other chip. And I still get a warning in Homebrew every single time I try to bundle. But Homebrew did not work out of the box. And the reason is... The TZ info gem, I guess, used to come standard with Ruby and it does not come with it anymore. So if you have problems doing brew install on a new Mac Big Sur, check the error because it clearly says, hey, we don't have any TZ info. And luckily, I write Rails and I was very thankful for that because I was like, oh, I know what TZ info is. And I just gem installed it and then we were off to the races. But certain packages fail, but I've had one fail, I think. Yeah, I set up a 13-inch MacBook Pro the week before Big Sur came out. And I had no problems. And then I upgraded to Big Sur and I had no problems. So, but I don't have an M1. I actually bought my computer right before. I bought it on Sunday and they had the press conference or whatever their event on Wednesday. And I was like, ah, what do I do here? I made a grown-up decision. I kept it. Well, I mean, you're screwed if you want to run Docker. I read through that Docker issue. It's not looking too hot. 
for them. So they're looking probably at many months. M I N I or M A N Y? Well, they're not even close. What I got from the issue, of course, something complete like this person could have been saying, like they were from the org, but they could have been saying one thing and really, you know, someone else has stayed up to 4 a.m. and almost got it. But apparently they're not even close. So it could be like many moons. Yeah, we'll just raise another round of funding and hire a few thousand developers and do it in quicker time, right? That's how that mythical man month talked about. Just more people, less time, I think. Yeah, maybe. We never talked about Hayes' amazing stunt they're doing where they have a literal dumpster fire. Yeah, it is pretty amazing. I love that. (laughs) I was telling Shannon about it last night, and Shannon usually just doesn't listen to me talk because I have nothing of interest to say to her. And I told her about that. Her head peeked up, and she was like, send me a link. I was like, it's 930. They've already stopped. But it's pretty cool. I need context, cool. dude. I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, oh you so, didn't see it? No, and I have hey, but I don't... What My email? What? Question mark? Okay. These marketing geniuses have set up a literal dumpster fire. I think it's in Detroit where their head of marketing is. And you email dumpsterfire at hey.com. It prints out a piece of paper, sends it up a conveyor belt, then drops it into the dumpster fire. And this whole thing is live streamed. I don't remember the URL and it'll be over by the time this thing airs. But yeah, so you literally can see the printout and then it gets burned. It's very cathartic. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's hey.science or something and then dumpsterfire.email. What, what was funny was I, I saw Jason Freed tweet about it and I clicked on it, but my router has some security thing on it where if it detects a dot email domain, it just blocks it as if it's a spam URL. And I was like, it, Jason's site doesn't even work. And I was like, that's weird. Then I like got off Wi-Fi and I was like, oh, this is amazing. What could have been better is if they use like a dot matrix printer with the noise. Of- so great. That would have been awesome. <laughs> that would have been amazing. There were problems with it. And somebody was like, it wouldn't be 2020 without going wrong. And then somebody else was like, it just shows that it's real. Like it's a- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think Hacker News comments were like, it's kind of amazing to watch the paper fly out and miss the dumpster. And then someone run over and pick it up and put it in there manually. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. And I just got to say, poor Mother Earth, you know, I hate to be the environment person, but I, God damn it. <laughs> So somebody brought that up, I think, on Jason Fried's Twitter. I would never say it. That's my... (laughs) Those are the inside thoughts, you know? Everyone's having fun. (laughs) Somebody did say it, and they talked about how they actually only turn the fire on right as something drops into it. Wow, that's just extra. And But still, dude, the dedication to the meme is something I respect so much more than being able to breathe. So the air is going to crap here anyway, so, you know. At least I can see an actual dumpster fire. That's that's pretty cool. I'm assuming that it's going to be on YouTube. I will have to find that. And I is uh, a link in the show notes. Yeah, it is now being streamed live on Twitch slash dot com slash Basecamp and YouTube dot com slash Basecamp. So if you want to watch it live, you can, which is amazing. So if you go to that Detroit Andy, he's the guy who's the marketing head, and he's got like a Raspberry Pi running cups for the printing. And he said three hours ago, GFCI blew and took down the containers network rebooting. And he's like kind of live tweeting, like actually running this site. And it's pretty awesome. So it's fun to look at these tweets and see how they like hacked it all together. Yeah, I love the design on the site. This is awesome. Did you see the, the PPS we're offsetting by three times every bit of CO2 this creates? Hey, man, I don't care. I'm just going to bring it up. So someone's got to bring it up. <laughs> just so I mean, because you are right. Someone has to bring it up. Your generation doesn't know what you're doing, bro. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> I actually only said that to slowly work my way to that dig. Honestly, I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> this was you're playing the long it, game. I, I played the long game. I'm, I'm glad it came. Oh, I feel good. Yeah, it's wonderful. How do y'all feel? <laughs> uh, feels great. <laughs> just, 
<laughs> embracing my old age of 31. So damn. You're gonna be retiring soon, right? Yeah, you know it. That tech life. Oh <laughs> uh, well, this was fun. Andrew, I'm glad you're back. Yes. I'm glad to continue to talk to you as always. Have a yeah. good Thanksgiving, guys. Yeah, a lot to be thankful for. So. Yeah. Definitely. All right. Well, on that note, see you later. Later.